Yes. Okay, yes. over to you, uh, Sangu and Sanya. Sango, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, yeah, okay, now we can. Yeah, so actually, uh, Sanya is going to introduce the session. Okay. So, has Sanya joined uh, the session? Yes, yes, she has. Uh, but I think if if she's not here, I'll just I'll just introduce uh, Professor uh, Satpati. So Professor Samanyu Satpati uh, is the chair for this session. Okay, I'll uh, maybe. Yeah, begin. Professor. Yeah, Professor Satpati is former professor and head of the department English, University of Delhi, India. He was educated mostly at Indian universities. In the initial years of his career, he taught in the tribal areas of India, such as Mayurbhanj and Meghalaya. He taught for nearly two decades at the postgraduate department of English of the University of Delhi. He has also been a visiting professor at Jamia Media Islamia, University of Granada, Spain. Goethe University of Frankfurt, Germany, and many others. Uh, prior to joining KR Mangalam University, he was a fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Rashtrapati Bhavan, Simla, uh, 2016-2018. Besides his teaching, research, and publishing, he has also been a member of several administrative and decision-making bodies. Uh, Professor Satpati's core specialization is in the area of Anglophone and vernacular modernism, and more recently in post-colonialism. I request Professor Satpati to uh, kindly take the floor and introduce the speakers for today's session. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, uh, my heartfelt gratitude to the organizers of this wonderful conference happening at a global level, uh, thanks to the pandemic. And um, uh, I'm especially thankful to Hans Hada and Nisar Jaiti. Uh, you know, for, for asking me to take part um, in this particular, am I audible? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, yes. In this conference, you know, the, 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 I listened to many of the papers yesterday, plenary session and even today. Uh, you know, the papers have been very impressive uh, generally. And today, in I, I hope uh, the audience is not already tired after uh, two uh, wonderful sessions, you know, very rich uh, sessions. And even this one promises to be a very um, rich one uh, with an uh, uh, impressive uh, panel of uh, three speakers um, uh, who appear to be relatively young. Uh, and uh, you know, I will not take much time because I've noticed that um, you know, time is, a, uh, is at a premium. Uh, every session, uh, every in every session, uh, speakers are uh, requested to either cut short uh, their uh, discussion or uh, the presentation. So I will request each of the speakers to not uh, to to be very mindful. Uh, you know, though my job here would be uh, personally uh, that of a timekeeper. Uh, there are three speakers, and uh, they are. I'll read out their names: uh, Dr. Drupadi Chattopadhyay, Dr. Tana Tivedi and uh, Dr. Uh, Avishek uh, Pundir. You know, uh, as you can see uh, from the, uh, the, the, the list circulated, uh, Drupadri Chattopadhyay, this first speaker, is an assistant professor at the Department of English, SNTT Women's University, Mumbai. She has been trained in uh, literary studies at Lady Sri Ram College, New Delhi, and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Um, as well as at uh, Heidelberg. Uh, she specializes in post-colonial studies, cultural studies, digital humanities, and emerging literatures. Uh, you know, I, I look forward to her. And, uh, the second speaker is Tana Tivedi. I'm reading out all the brief bio notes so that I don't have to return to them. This is a faculty at the Amrit Modi School of Management, Ahmedabad, uh, Ahmedabad University, Gujarat. Her areas of interest and research include post-colonial diaspora, oceanic literature, and memory studies. And third uh, speaker, 
uh, happens to be from you know the department uh, at Jamia itself. Uh, her areas, his areas of interest are Indian philosophy, modernity, modernism, philosophy of religion, Marxism, and translation studies. Um, now, as I could see it, uh, uh, you know, the three speakers will be um, talking about some aspect or the other of, uh, you know, life writing in the uh, overarching concept, uh, you know, framework of, uh, you know, the subject of the conference at the Vernacula. So, uh, without any further ado, may I request Dr. Drupadi Chattopadhyay to, to uh, make her presentation. Uh, thank you, sir, for a uh, very, very kind uh, introduction. Um, I'll just begin my presentation. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so my paper is titled uh, Telling Lives in Forked Tongues, uh, reading Shanta Gokhale and Navanita Devshin's autobiographical writings. Um, so life writing seems to be a somewhat recent literary practice which presents itself uh, most prominently in the 19th century in the Indian context. So what this form meant to do in the Indian context is under continuous discussion, but what it seems to have accomplished nevertheless is catapult otherwise marginal speaking subjects into prominence. However marginal their voices were in the larger literary canon, women's life writing seems to have found a steady purchase by the end of the 19th century. Often written uh, in the confessional mode, these life writings frequently challenged received notions of the text and subjectivities. As Shanta Gokhale would note in her translation of Lakshmi Bai Telak's autobiography, Smriti Chitre, The Memoirs of a Spirited Wife, and I quote, originally begun at her son's request and published in four parts between 1931 and 1936, Smriti Chitre gave Lakshmi Bai a visibility that her poetry alone may not have done. At this juncture, the life writings, whether in the form of autobiographies or memoirs, took over other forms of writings and appeared in the form of journals, diaries, autobiographies, and serialized in magazines, etc often written from locations of privileged and backed primarily by reform movement um, or movements, this proliferation of life writings ran its course by independence. However, this form found a new lease of life with Dalit feminist movement, which chose life writing as their primary tool of political expression. Contrary to the course of discussion of women's life writing that have obfuscated linguistic practices in search for critiquing hegemonic discursive practices and subjective agency, I argue that a certain kind of bilingualism has been central to the presence of counter discourses. The rise of marginalized feminisms that emerged in response to a hegemonic Savarna feminism foregrounded testimonials, to borrow Sharmila Rege's term, written in the vernacular. And I argue that this left the upper class, upper class, upper caste privileged woman to reinvent the genre, to articulate their angst for a subjective agency. As writers of fiction, translators, and academicians, Shanta Gokhale, who was born in 1939, and Abonita Devshin, born in 1938, died in 2019, chose to write their lives both in their vernaculars as well as English. In terms of profile, Gokhale and Dev Singh seem to have uncannily similar trajectories. They were both born in privilege in terms of class, caste, and geographical locations. They were very urbane and brought up in decidedly unconventional households with parents keen to invest in the English education of their girl child or children. Robust literary cultures, Marathi and Bengali, and their modernities framed through the reform movements were key to their essentially bilingual upbringing. However, this bilinguality of their parents was divided not merely along class, but importantly, gender lines. While the women were comfortable in the vernacular, English was the prerogative of the men folk. And Gokhale writes about how um, in, in, in her one of her blog posts, for instance, she writes about how she wrote letters to her father in English and to her mother um, in, in Marathi when she was in England. It is only with the next generation that the travels between the worlds of English and vernacular will become more fluid and thus also tentative. One should perhaps note here that the politics of bilinguality that I suggest would constantly shift in the course of their lives. So it's, it's not a constant. 
And the clear divide between these linguistic spheres will give way to conscious literary choices. Davidson, in her essay, Matri Pasha, addressed to her mother as a kid, asked why mother tongue is equated with mother's milk, even when one can potentially grow up with bottled milk. To which she answers that all answers to our understanding of languages emanate from languages of our mothers and grandmothers, to which is tied our closeness. Um, fractured, therefore it is fractured, and, and she says that it is fractured in terms of Rajabhasha, Devabhasha, Rashtrabhasha, and our subjectivities come to life only in the mother tongue. So both uh, Devsen and uh, Gokhale have associated the mother tongue uh, with, with, with a female or, or feminist genealogy, as it were. Crucial to this was the role of their mothers. Radharani Devi, Devsen's mother, was a prominent Bengali poet who wrote under the pseudonym Aparajita, and Gokhale's mother was one of the first women to receive Western education. However, formal Western education. However, these genealogies are not always even and continuous. Davidson, for instance, would construct a biography of her maternal grandmother out of her personal experience and through written accounts of her maternal uncle. Narayuni, her grandmother, content in her domesticity and her adherence to patriarchal norm, plays as the perfect counterfoil to her mother's resistance. Although they were encouraged to think beyond the confines of the modern education system, they seem to have done exceptionally well within the system. They were students of English studies in India and in England at a time when the discipline was looking to test its scope in terms of form, methodologies, textualities, and content. While Davidson argued for comparative frameworks within the uh, domain of Indian literature to address questions of marginality, Gokhale's seminal contribution to the world of Marathi translations into English upset set narratives about Marathi literary historiographies. Critiques of the earlier academic order can be found in their writings along with a call to re-estimate what constitutes literary studies in India. As critics, prolific translators, and creators of original literary content, they were situated tantalizingly both inside and the outside of academic practices. Both were acutely aware of the possibilities for comparative frameworks that would emerge from translations into English. This made their writings acutely aware of the possibilities of the afterlives of their works. And working through the bilingual poetic influences in her life, Davidson, in fact, attempts at critiquing her own work, akin to racial prejudice where all Chinese men seem to look alike, all writing by women seem to appear alike, according to her. To distinguish her writing from others, she dismisses the notion of influence as an operative category and instead works through the internal mechanics of poetry. Faced with the breakdown of respective, their respective marriages, both shoulder the responsibility of bringing up their children in a household helmed by their strong mothers. Divorce brought them back to their paternal homes, and their new homes carry the burden of their personal struggles as single women, leaving them to reinvent their associations with the familiar. And both of them reinvent their homes anew, seeking to constitute a continuum, continuum that does not dismiss the rupture. This not only firmly situates them in their linguistic context, but also becomes a site of their future negotiations with their identities. Incidentally, both would also have daughters, Renuka Sahani and Nandona Shen, who would go, go on to become moderately successful commercial film actors. And both Gokhale and Dave Sain battled cancer, uh, which is very prominent in their life writings. While Dave Sain succumbed to it in November 2019, Gokhale is still fighting the disease. Looking for means to legitimize their self-representational practice, they heavily rely on self-deprecating humor. Importantly, for both of them, this humor emerges when their otherwise privileged selves are compromised. And reliance on humor not only deflects from emphasizing on a stable subjectivity, but also locates the narrative authority away from within the text. And these complex negotiations are to be read in between languages and not despite them. Taking cue from Gokhale and Davidson, I further argue that these new subjectivities, in an attempt to accommodate novel frameworks of experience, cautiously choose the in-between spaces of the vernacular and English as their preferred site of identity production. Um, reading humor in the everyday. 
One of the first things that Shanta Gokhale notes about Lakshmi Rai Tilak's autobiography is the power of the literary storytelling that existed in my language Marathi that bolsters what she calls the unfailing comical touch. This comical touch is something that Gokhale and Devsim both carefully cultivate in their life writings. I contend that their humor and irony present themselves in contradistinction to their literary foremothers by foregrounding irony as a legitimizing device. The two contexts that I explore in this section, sense of place and the notion of body, will allude to their subjectivities that exploit the humor born out of legitimizing uncertainties. Gokhale and Devsen's identities are rooted in their sense of place. Devsen writings, uh, in, in fact, um, uh, Gokhale has recently published an entire book on, on this called uh, Dada 28. Um, Devsen's writings are secured at the veranda of her parental house in Kolkata, the space where her inner and outer worlds meet. Um, and her life writings are called Bhalo Basha Baranda. So Bhalo Basha is, is her paternal uh, house in Kolkata and, and the baran veranda, which is very, very central to her writings. Um, in a city which has otherwise seen many comings and goings, Gokhale finds a space in a historically um, uh, 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 Marathi-speaking locality of Shibaji Park or Dada 28. Uh, rarely are women blessed with, um, uh, uh, with such blissful singlehood. The pleasure, as she says, is not confined only to having my own space, my own work table and my own bookshelves. It extends to having my own cool bed. I consider a cool bed a vital part of my singlehood. And this is what she writes uh, soon after her uh, second divorce. An innocuous morning walk is used by both writers to set their territory of negotiating the sense of place. In a section titled Morning Walk, 18th February 2019, she takes the reader along as she traverses the length of Shivaji Park. She introduces each tree in the process, giving a both personal and institutional Sorry, Zhrupadi, uh, you have just got three minutes left. Okay. Uh, okay, so she... Uh, I'll just uh, maybe give you two examples. Uh, she settles into the familiarity, including meeting her 82-year-old stalker, which reminds her of Surekha Punekar Lavani. The leaf is ready to fall, but the stalk is still green. And so she continues uh, like this and talks about Shivaji Park, which is an, an institute, even with its multilinguality, uh, she, she basically historicizes the Marathiness of, of Shivaji Park and her location uh, within um, it. And Devsen uses the benign trope of morning walk uh, to actually disrupt her sense of place and home. So she talks about when um, uh, her, her, her familiar is disrupted or when uh, Amartya Shen wins uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize. And uh, the police actually asks her to remove um, or her, um, uh, her displacement is complete as the police forces erases her identity and overrides her sense of place. So the police asks her to remove her own car from outside her, her house when Amar uh, visits. And uh, then uh, the next, uh, in the next section, I talk about their own uh, ways of, of uh, you know, engaging with their body and with, with cancer in, in particular, um, and the sort of humor uh, that, that emerges uh, out of it. Um, uh, and Gokhale is uh, very, very particular about talking about every part of her body. Uh, in fact, her, her memoir is, is, is uh, as she says, a writerly attempt to talk about the, the body. Um, uh, and and Davison actually uh, problematizes uh, this in, in, for example, she has a, a small essay called Bedroom, uh, where she says the bedroom and shobar ghar, which literally translates into a space to sleep, are not the same, and she sort of engages uh, with that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just running out of uh, time. Um, I would just like to quote one small uh, 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 attempt uh, on Dave Sen's part to talk about cancer, where she says that I don't care kana kori, jani shami sando kori. And when people started visiting her from far and wide as her health started failing, she insisted that she would first contest an election, then organize a feast, and only afterwards start her Shubo Jatra or her final auspicious uh, journey. 
Um, so be the context of their marriage, their deceased bodies, their loves lost, the life writings of both the writers in question firmly raises the question of literary choice. In case of Gokhale, who, who firmly locates herself in the context of Marathi linguistic practice, writes her first novel, Rita Wellinger, which is a fictionalized memoir in Marathi and then uh, sort of translates it into English. And despite a celebrated, uh, celebrated forays in creative writing in Marathi, she wrote her memoirs in uh, English. On the other hand, um, uh, Nobody Tadev Shen reserves English as a language only of academic discourse and continues um, and continue to write in, in, in Bengali about her life, life writings in particular. As we have seen that these spheres collide and animate each other and these movements within and without brings their, to focus their fractured consciousness that affects their uh, literary choices. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Drupadi. Uh... It was a uh, wonderful paper and, uh, you know, one of the important things that um, occurred to me, uh, the, one of the important things that you took up was about uh, translational aspects, you know, I do not know whether you are present yesterday when Sudhupta Kavita made that point about how uh, as a Bengali, uh, while writing English, he writes as a Bengali. Uh, something uh, like that is happening in the case of, in both the cases of the writers that you are talking about. Uh, it's not uh, an ordinary, it's not in an ordinary sense that they are bilingual writers. And this is a distinction that Sudhita Kaviraj also makes yesterday. It's about uh, writing in one language, even while, uh, you know, uh, being, uh, you know, the master of another language. So this aspect, you know, apart from uh, the many other aspects of their work that you talked about was quite striking. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next paper by uh, Dr. Tana Trivedi, uh, though it's not yes. uh, strictly mentioned as uh, neither in the uh, abstract nor in the title as uh, a part of life writing as a Fijian Indian uh, poet, uh, you know, the, the, the poetry uh, is obviously uh, charged by, you know, autobiographical elements, the idea of uh, identity, um, a hybrid identity. Uh, we look, look forward to your paper, uh, Tana Thibault. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Samanyu. Am I uh, audible? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, you are. Yes, okay. All right. I'll go on. Uh, Drupadi, that was a very interesting paper. I must say, enjoyed listening to you. Um, so can I can I start? Uh, can I share my screen? Is that all right? Yes, you can uh, share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just right. I hope my screen is visible. Yes. Yes. I'm. Uh, the title of my paper is the ghostly vernacular language in Indo-Fijian. Thank you. Uh, it is uh, the ghostly vernacular uh, language in Indo-Fijian poetry. Um, so I'm going to take you all to feed the problem with my internet. It says it's unstable. If in case there is a glitch somewhere, please let me know and uh, I'll see if I can, if I have to switch off my video, I might have to do that. Um, so I am looking at the works of a contemporary poet uh, called Sudesh Mishra. He's a fourth generation of Fijian Indian Australian poet who chronicles the post memories of ancestral trauma associated with indenture and settlement of Indians in Fiji through language. Um, that is just one of the ways in which he chronicles, but a very significant way. His poetry, though largely written in English, incorporates and enfolds multilingualism in a way that subverts the historical colonial claim to language, opening a window into emerging language dynamics of the Indian diaspora in the Pacific. Transported to the Pacific Islands in the late 19th century under the colonial uh, rule to work on sugarcane plantations, Indian bore the burden of displacement and trauma only to be ou ousted once again and displaced once again uh, through the coups that happened in 1987 and 2000. There have been multiple coups that have happened even after that, uh, which makes the position of Indians in Fiji uh, extremely precarious. Um, the precarity of the lives have uh, has been chronicled through Mishra's poetry. That is, uh, that is that is literally haunted by uh, Hindi, Bhojpuri, Fijian Hindi, Fijian uh, colonial English, different kinds of languages which kind of amalgamate through his work. Um, okay, my screen here. Hang on. Um, 
Yes. Can can you see the second slide, uh, Professor Bidani? Is it? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Right. Yeah. So uh, the vernacular in case of Indians living in Fiji is a highly uh, uh, crepuscular space that is inhabited by the ghosts of languages no longer present. It is an ev ever evolving fluid space that is replaced by dislocations that create newer spaces, constantly questioning the historical past. So the, I'm looking at Sudesh Mishra, like I said, he's a contemporary fourth generation uh, uh, of Indo-Fijian. I'll begin by quoting one of his poems, which is written as a part of, uh, you know, one of his, uh, on, on one of his travels to India, um, Memoirs of a Reluctant Traveler. And he says, a brisk language connects me to India. I am my ancestor fleeing its famine. Looking in the mirror, I only I see only him. The young Girmitya departing India, in India trying to get away from India. I'd ride a reindeer to get away from India. So, um, of course, this is written in, in, in 1994 when he, he, when, he went, when he was traveling to India. But the image of a young Girmitya departing from his famine-ridden homeland that haunts the modern day poet raises questions of migration, identity, and language that have occupied critical spaces in diasporic articulations in the last decade of the 20th century. Stricter norms on migration and citizenship on the other, questions of assimilation, hybridity, and belongingness are being examined against the con context of transnationalism and border crossings in contemporary theories of globalization and transnational movements. In fact, even the concept of language has undergone significant questioning and rethinking in times of digital mobilities and transnationalism of the 21st century. Once associated with traumatic exile, dispersal and identity crisis as a result of rootlessness, the field of diaspora studies is now dominated by studies of mobility, boundaries and transnational movements. The idea of language is integral, is integral to all discussions of diaspora since it is a singularly critical space that de defines individuals, communities and even nations. One question that this paper attempts to answer is, where does one locate the vernacular, both historically and geographically, for the fourth generation um, for the fourth generation of Indians in Fiji, who have been doubly displaced, um, who have been doubly displaced once by historical event of the indenture, and the second by the contemporary political crisis in form of coups. Through the poetry of Sudesh Mishra, a contemporary Indo-Fijian poet, the notion of language is significantly redefined to represent the post-colonial nation of Fiji as a multitudinous structure of indenture, displacement, settlement, and diaspora. The first, um, so it, his poetry is written largely in free verse um, and, there, and thereby, because it is written in free verse, it also becomes a tool to understand um, because he also incorporates a lot of, uh, he writes largely in English. Um, his poetry becomes a tool to understand why a, a nation cannot be free from the vestiges of colonialism and how poetry, when also removed from the immediacy of the context, provides an insight into new relationships with time, memory, and language. Uh, let me see if this, yeah. So the nation and its people in discussion. Uh, I'm looking at Fiji, right? And to just give you a slight historical backdrop of uh, Fiji, um, it is, an, uh, it is a cluster of three, about 300 islands um, and uh, Sir Arthur Hamilton Gordon, who was the first governor, first substantiative, substantiative governor of Fiji, uh, was the one who started the the the, the trade, uh, or let's say the, the the process of Girmit between India and Fiji. Uh, the colonial government decided to set up sugarcane plantation, uh, and for that he invited the Australian company called Colonial Sugar Refining Company. CSR is very important because it, it finds its way through a lot of Mishra's poetry. Um, but as a part of this indenture, about 60,000 Indians uh, migrated from India into Fiji between 1880 to 1920. Most of them came from Northern India, about 80% from Uttar Pradesh, 13% from Bihar and Bengal, and the rest from Southern India. They spoke Hindi, Urdu, Gujarati, Tamil, Telugu, and Punjabi. Um, 
about 85.3% were Hindus, 14.6% were Muslims, and the remaining were Sikhs and Christians. Um, so while several generations of Indians have settled into Fiji, Fiji gained independence in 1970, but the system of Girmit ended, uh, or uh, the, the, the indenture stopped in 1920. And after that, the laborers, uh, the you know, the, the subsequent generations have settled into Fiji. Most of them are engaged, uh, were engaged into agriculture. And then, of course, you have the second, uh, you know, the way of migration with the Gujaratis going in um, uh, as traders. So while Mishra's poems are a repository of historical displacement of Indians, uh, his work also captures a trauma of, of the people working on, uh, the Indians working on sugarcane plantations. Um, okay, um, because we don't have, uh, I mean, I might, I, I might run out of time. I'm, I'm just going to go on uh, talking about two of his works, which I would like to discuss today. Um, one is uh, a, a, a long prose poem called Diaspora and the Difficult Art of Dying. And the second one is Leela. Right? Um, the vernacular is often referred to as the parochial, as, as, as parochial and rooted in local sensibilities, invoking notions of belongingness to a particular space. This idea of the vernacular as expressing a sense of belongingness to a region is and often invoking nostalgia for a lost homeland in case of the diaspora, especially in Fiji, is challenged by Mishra through his works. And this he does in a twofold manner. One, by demonstrating the transition, transformation, and fusion of the vernacular Bhojpuri and Hindi with the Fijian vernacular. And the other, by transnationalizing the vernacular through his own self, his journeys, and his articulations. These are the two texts I'm looking at. Both are, are written in free verse. Um, and I'm going to straight away um, go to the first one which is, um, but before I go on here, I would just like to uh, give uh, some information about the languages in Fiji. Uh, Fiji is characterized by predominantly two languages. One is Fijian and Fiji Hindi, especially when we look at Indians, uh, a local non-standard variety of Hindi, which is not written, Fiji Hindi. Uh, some writers have attempted to write in Fiji Hindi, but it doesn't really have a, a script in that sense. Um, although English is spoken natively by probably no more than one to three percent of uh, Fiji Islanders, its important role is is uh, really uh, as as something that the island has inherited from its colonial uh, past. A lot of education takes place in English. Uh, there are the presence of other languages, like I said, Urdu, Gujarati, Malayalam, Punjabi. Um, however, typically all the speakers um, speak Fiji Hindi. And it is one of the most. Uh, it, it is it is one of the largest languages spoken on the island. There are other languages also, such, such as Cantonese, Mandarin, and Kiribati, which are also the other vernacular languages that are present on the island. So we are looking at a set of three hundred islands, which which really have a whole lot of different languages uh, all coming together. Uh, standard Hindi is also one of the languages of Fiji, and it is used largely during the reading of Ramayana and Mahabharata, and that is exactly what. I am going to uh, also uh, discuss uh, when I look at Sudesh Mishra and uh, his uh, second text, which I'm going to discuss, which is Leela. Now, Diaspora and the Difficult Art of Dying was published in 2002, and it is, it is written largely in the manner of stream of consciousness. Um, this is how the poem begins, or the prose poem, as he, as he says. In the end is my memory of the beginning, a mixed brew of history and hyperbole. The sun's chakra breaking up the earth of Basti into a million, six million jigsaw pieces. I, the eldest of the three sons, 16 years old, already corroded by despair, stealing away from home and village and province, walking by day and sleeping by night. Yeah, the image of, of uh, you know, a Girmitya, a young Girmitya walking away, which also resonates with the, 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 the stanza I read in the beginning, um, is a sense of walking away. It is a sense of movement. Right, where uh, people afflicted, largely uh, the population afflicted by poverty um, uh, uh, and lured by the Arkatis or the recruiters to go to Fiji as a promised land, uh, start from their bastis to actually go into another basti. Right, the word basti is a colloquial expression from Urdu, uh, in Urdu referring to a ghetto, is also the name of one of the districts in, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, from which a lot of, uh, from which place a lot of Girmityas were also recruited. Right. 
Um, so, uh, as he goes okay, on, he Anna, says, uh, yes. Sorry, I can already see that you are hurrying up to finish your paper. I do I have time. I've already, yeah, you just go out four minutes more. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I've not even come to my discussion. Okay, so let me just uh, let me just discuss the poetry uh, and his writing, and I think I'll I'll stop with that. So you know what I um, what I really wanted to discuss is his writing. Uh, his writing is is really and uh, you know and his the way he amalgamates, the way he brings together different expressions, ranging from um, you know very very um, typical Indian. Uh, you know, invoking the ideas of an Indian setting to actually taking us to the sugarcane plantations in Fiji, uh, you know, and getting us to experience the trauma language. I I understand he uses in a way to invoke uh, not not a sense so much of um, you know of a lost ho homeland, but also that of a sense of movement. Uh, so if if you you know if I go to the next slide, through this poem he actually traces a set of change that takes place in the Indians who have migrated into Fiji, right? So between the hell of Girmit and the hell of Basti was an ocean of alchemy, and by alchemy he refers to a sort of a change that takes place uh, within the migrants, right? And uh, eventually when he says that. Uh, you know, this as this poem uh, moves, he traces the journey of this one particular Girmitya, who is his ancestor, into multiple generations till he finally stops at his own generation. Right? Um, I what I find fascinating is this play of language. You know, this this movement from uh, you know uh, using uh, expressions in Hindi and Bhojpuri to actually talking about or, or expressing uh, in a very Fijian um, language, right? Uh, uh, Fijian expressions also, right? The idea of a Degi, for instance, right? When he says that uh, the oceanic present leaked into my memory of an Indian past until a time came when I could no longer think of Machli, for instance, without thinking of Ika. It was as if Machli as a word and idea and culture had never ex existed prior to Ika, right? So it is a sense of migration. It is a sense of uh, moving beyond migration into metamorphosizing into a newer um, set of identity. Finally, the poem ends with uh, Rajesh, who is also, you know, who is really uh, Mishra himself, writing at a desk and stories about writing stories about his ancestors. Um, you know, uh, of course, with a certain sense of nostalgia, but also a sense of having literally migrated and floated from one identity to the other. Very quickly, the other uh, prose, uh, you know, in fact, Mishra himself says, Dila is a play, performance, sport, display, free motion or movement. There is no fixed structure that he even gives to Dila, right? It is very difficult to categorize, uh, in fact, uh, quite a few of Mishra's own works because there is no structure that he gives to it. In this, uh, in, 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 in Leela, it is actually the description of um, uh, Ram Leela that is uh, uh, enacted uh, every year, right? And um, um, uh, you have uh, uh, Indians who, uh, you know, uh, he remembers, of course, this is, uh, this is a memory. Um, it, is, um, it is a week-long performance of an old mythological text, right, by Tulsidas, uh, which translates into an interrogation of memories and language where the narrator tra traverses through different historical times of the Indo-Fijian community to establish a sense of identity that is diasporic and transnational. Right. It is significant in a way that Mishra discusses the transformation of the self mirrored through a similar metamorphosis of language. So um, he says Tulsidasa's Hindi was interspersed with incantations of Sanskrit. But my trouble with Shuddha Hindi that I had to memorize for the Leela brought about an awareness of a different Hindi I spoke at home, in the streets among friends. Fiji Bath, a Hindi that grew out of Girmit experience at once vital, revolved, earthy, poetic, ironic, impure, maligned, a hybrid monster of Hindi that drew sustenance from Fijian and English, among other languages, a Hindi that made proper names of other languages improper. Right? This is extremely fascinating how he engages with language.
language in this particular text of his. You know, participating in Leela because he is one of the characters in Leela. Through that entire performance, we also see the language being performed. We also see the culture being performed. We also see um, on the side there is a certain dialogue that is going on in terms of the identities that are, um, you know, that are taking root. Um, uh, so, yeah. I might not want, I may not have time to get into everything, but one more, a couple of more uh, quotations. Please wind up uh, with one or two sentences. This. So he uh, says, should the Hindi, yes. Okay, we are already out of time, <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, when he talks about Shuddha Hindi, he is also uh, critical about Shuddha Hindi, saying that, that in a diasporic identity, in a transnational identity, like you can talk about Shuddha Hindi, because that has also undergone significant change. Um, so somewhere he, you know, I, I'd like to just conclude by saying that aesthetic and cultural values are derived this is Hobi Baba, I'm quoting him. Aesthetic and cultural values are derived from those boundaries between languages, territories, and communities that belong, strictly speaking, to no one culture. These are values produced in, no, in, in the ongoing practices and performances of crossing over, and they become meaningful as cultures to the extent to which they are intricately and intimately interweaved with one another. And this is exactly what we find happening through Mishra's work. There is an interweaving and there is a sort of interconnectivity, which dissolves the, you know, which which really makes us question the idea of vernacular. So with this, I will um, stop. Um, yeah, I have to you. run through it, but yes. Thank you, Dr. Tarna Trivedi. It was an excellent presentation. I'm sorry, uh, I must apologize to all those speakers, but I'm being cruel only to be kind so that there is enough time left for us to discuss your paper. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, we move on to the next thank paper. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, by uh, uh, Abhishek. And uh, this also, this promises to be a very interesting paper. Uh, Shekhar, it's, it's on Shekhar and life, Agaya's work in Hindi. Uh, so uh, please. Hello to all. Uh, before reading out the paper, I would be reading out only the relevant parts uh, which I would feel would make sense to you. But before reading that, I want to read an opening statement for the paper. Uh, anybody listening to this statement would be able to, you know, uh, uh, you know, make sense of the paper, even if I read it incomplete. So, reading with the, uh, the brief bio of the author, Sachidanda Hiranan Achan Bagya who was known to have inaugurated modernity, modernism in Hindi literature. He wrote poems, short stories, plays, novels, essays, and travelogues, and translated works from and into English, among them some of his own novels and poems. He edited several literary journals and anthologies and published some of the noted names of, in these journals, which later would emerge and form their own theories of literature. He remained an influential, influential figure sorry, for Hindi poetry and short story till the decline of Nai Kavita and Nai Kahani moment. Born in an upper class Brahmin family, he was homeschooled and had access to several literary traditions Persian, Urdu, Sanskrit, and English. Harish Trivedi, as a casual remark in a publication to commemorate the birth centennial year of Agya, suggests that he be considered T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound for Hindi poetry and be situated in the modern tradition of poet novelists, much like D.H. Lawrence. Among Agya's three published novels, Shekhar Alive has invited much attention in Hindi literary circles. The novel was published in two parts, first part published in 1941 and second in 1944. The work is either dismissed or celebrated as bringing Western sensibility to Hindi novel and turning its back on Indic traditions of Katha Kahani Sahitya. Marxist critics have seen Shekhar as an individual, disconnected from the larger political scene and rather interested in articulating narrow artistic aesthetic positions. And, and others have applauded Shekhar for providing fresh avenues for psychological novels and novels dealing with interior landscape of characters. The psychological studies of the novel exist focus on relation and conflicts of its titular character with the society, and through many vicissitudes chart the growth of Shekhar, the artist and the revolutionary. And one also theorizes incompleteness of revolution in the novel. However, for the present study, I hesitantly put forth alienation as method 
approach to focus on the travails of Shekhar in its negotiation with the post colonialist society. That stands at the crossroads of cultures, fears for its cherished traditions and civilizational ethos, and feels an emerging modern sensibility that motivates change and the resultant formation of its subjectivity. To this effect, the idea of divided subjectivity, Dwandi Chetas, is borrowed from Sanjay Gautam's thesis on Muktibod and Muktibodian self that admits it as a rupture from pre modern subjectivity in Hindi poetry and posits it as a challenge to and different from Bhakti and Chayavadian conceptualization of unified being. The existence of duality, the aesthetic self, and the revolutionary committed to social cause, traditions, and innovations, the individualistic impulses in society, or in Shekhar's own scheme, seeds and sprouts, nature and men, man and circumstance, bondage and curiosity inform the narrative of Shekhar. In an interview on being asked how should one read the novel, Agya highlighted that one sutra runs through the novel and could be used to unravel its narrative. The quest for freedom. In Agya's own words, this self may be realized or actualized in its relation with the society. However, the self doesn't nearly necessarily exist merely in relation with the society. It's point for complex relation between an individual and society. The term laghu mana or minor manner, minor man, sorry, was coined in post-independence in the poetry for an emergent consciousness that severe ties from all ideological murings and accepted conditions of alienation as primarily rooted in human existence. The minor men casted aspersions on any grand narratives of development and progress. I deploy minor men as a conceptual metaphor for reading and qualifying modernness of the emergent subjectivity, ridden with contradictions and embracing its precarity. Agya wished for himself and by extension for his literary characters that I shall become what I am. Jo main hu, wahi main ban in an interview while reminiscing about his journey in Upper Himalayan region, Agya shares that he saw a lone tree standing on the hillside against the wind, away from other trees, and philosophically elaborates that the tree had attained fuller growth, reserved for it by the nature. And that's what I wish for myself and for others, that I shall become what I am. The embedded question of what constitutes modern subjectivity and how to make sense of modernity in our context reappear within the scope of this paper. And I attempt to address some of these concerns by situating the text with overarching debates of modernity, modernism, specifically in case of Hindi and generally in Indian context. The paper is divided into three interconnected parts. The first part deals with various theoretical positions on, about modernity, modern, and their relevance or irrelevance in case of Hindi. Second part elaborates on alienation as method and reflects on relationality of alienation and modern. And third part brings out textual analysis of the developed framework. So I'm uh, skipping over the first part and jumping to the second part, which forms the thrust of uh, the idea of divided subjectivity in case of Yekha. Alienation has been taken as the most defining characteristic of modern men. The idea of alienation can be approached from varied perspectives, psychological, social, economic, and historical. Alienation, the state of being alien, brings to for a certain lack of participation, aloofness. And in psychology, the term is defined as separation or division of self, an inability to relate with the reality or estrangement from what is real, thus generating numbness. In philosophy, Hegel had first explained the term beyond its linguistic usage and developed a theory to explain a precondition of modernity. Marx used the concept of self alienation in his strictly social economic theory. However, it remains beyond doubt that alienation could exist and be explained in varied forms. It can be a historical development depending on the sociological register, and it can also be rooted in the general human condition. In classical Western theories, the concept of alienation presumes a conception of human essence from which one distances oneself. And the state of being alienated implies disruption of the essence or pure self owing to external conditions. Hegel diagnoses the disruption in human being owing to power structures. Marx also bells his, his socio-economic theory of alienation of labor on Hegelian dialectics between human and nature. On the other hand, to varying degree, the existentialists uh, regarded alienation as an integral feature of human existence. Overcoming alienation or creation of unannihilating selfhoods could be understood as a movement of returning to integrated subject. Then alienation is the condition of being with a deficient relation, ontological misapprehension with self, others, and the world. In existential philosophy, alienation is ahistorical and rooted in human existence. 
George Simmel summarizes the concept in inner tensions stemming from antagonisms of life and form. Man cannot be himself. He is destined to remain a stranger in the world in which he lives, unquote. and admits that the perennial opposition between life and form has intensified in our age. The act of immersion in the social order causes alienation, irrespective of the historical developments affecting human civilization. Any social order contains alienating forces which continuously act on an individual. This intersection, this interaction between social order and individual, also the process through which individual becomes into comes into being, affects disintegration of self. The condition of alienation admits of structural obstructions in associating or relating with the self, others, and the world. Kierkegaard developed the concept of appropriations, taking hold of oneself in practice to overcome the foreignness of self, others, and the world. In the progress, the subject constitutes itself in relation to the world in determinate form. The unalienated selfhood would be freely accessible to oneself. The post-enlightenment discourse expresses unflinching faith in sovereignty of reason, in finiteness of progress, and greatness of man, which were instrumental in bringing the, and expanding the idea of modernity to the human world. The discourse of enlightenment reason was questioned from a postmodern position to reveal its inherent deficiencies, namely imperialist desires and self alienating tendencies. In other words, postmodern of modernism offered a critique of sorry, a critique of universal and essential approach to human nature. It critiques the idea of integrated subjectivity that informs the, the classical concept of alienation. <clears throat> Indian literatures can be fruitfully studied through the lens of identity formation, social cultural representation, and linguistic expression of the condition of Indian subjects in general and particularized context. It is worth noting that an extensive concept of alienation undercuts these thematic collages, through which a historical assessment of Indian literatures and, in particular, Hindi literature is attempted. Although not specific to modernity, modernism alienation as a theme has been associated with modernist literature. Child situate uh, alienation in Euro uh, American modernist literature as a condition of loss and uncertainty. Modernism was a creative and artistic response to the process of modernization witnessed by Western societies and rapid industrial development and advanced technology, urbanization, secularization, and mass form of life. The loss of self defragmentation, schizophrenia, and inability to form meaningful relations were perceived as undesirable products of the process of modernization. Often, alienation in form of defragmentation is studied as a theme of modernity, modernism, and literature. Albeit, its conceptual formulation reveals processes underlying formation of subjectivity. The alienation as method would anchor on the close reading of the stylistic innovation, experimentation with form, and embedded exercise of meaning making and subject making in a text. With a view of using alienation as method for literary studies, I intend to chart out a brief history of subjectivity in Hindi literature and modern Hindi poetry in specific. In Hindi, the continuation of Indic spiritual and poetic traditions disallowed the articulation of divided subject. The emergence of divided subjectivity coincides with the birth of modern subject that attempts to break from the poetic traditions or absorb Western paradigms in Indic spiritual poetic tradition. It is difficult to trace alienation in terms of fragmented self in pre-modern Hindi poetry. However, a duality exi always existed in subjecthood, which was overcome through Indic spiritual plot philosophical traditions, or was embraced as a paradoxical whole. The first instances of the divided subjectivity, Dwandi Chetas, appear in poetry of progressive modernist in 19th century. Both are methods. Advent of modernism resulted in the emergence of divided subjectivity in post-colonial India, a new form of subjectivity that arose out of simultaneous commitment of the modern Indian poet as a thinking subject to two different competing and conflicting intellectual legacies, Western and Indian. <clears throat> the birth of modern subject in India could be fruitfully located then in a dialectical relation of vernacular and cosmopolitan, a multi-directional circulation of cultural practices, and certain intensification of intercultural contact zones. In the long duty of the modernities in Indian languages, one can delineate several historical developments that intensified cultural exchanges and reshaped worldviews. The project of colonial translation, standardization of Indian languages for print, proliferation of printed material, and rise of public sphere from one episode 
form one episode in the long st story of modernity in India. These developments are often associated with post-colonial modernity. The historical developments owing to colonial intervention in the socio-cultural spheres of the colonized mark, the contours of colonial modernity. However, the ideas and goods the exchange are also transformed by its new, uses its new position in a new time and place. Shekhar, a life runs into two parts with four chapters. In each part has a lengthy, uh, and uh, each part has four chapters and has a lengthy prologue. It sketches the life of a revolutionary and artist who constantly struggles for self-articulation and self-assertion. The novel can be fruitfully read as a building's Roma. The novel, according to Agya, the author, is the prologue. In the prologue, has an outcome of was an outcome of a vision seen in merely one night of intense pain. Shekhar was associated with a revolutionary group of young men and had been caught by colonial police one night. Facing the possibility of death by gallows, Shekhar meditates on the relevance and meaning of life. If this was going to be the end of my life, then what was the value of that life? What was the meaning? What did it accomplish for the individual, for society, for humanity? By morning, Shekhar had realized some truths which he delivered orally to the author and took him and it took him 10 years to completely express this vision seen over one night of intense pain. The framework of narrative within narrative is hardly new for Indian readers who are well familiar with Indian epics such as Mahabharata and Ramayana. An author chooses a familiar structure to reveal a truth akin to one's enshrined, uh, truth akin to one's enshrined in Indian epics. The identity of Shekhar, the narrator, is equated with that of a Shir who speaks of higher truths. As I quote from the no novel, there is a power in pain that gives sight. A person in pain can be a reasoner. Again, at the onset, warns new readers to not to mistake eye of the novel with the author himself and distance himself into from his creation following the dictate of T.S. Eliot. Agya gives his sources of inspiration promptly in the novel by extensively quoting from Western canon, ranging from Dante to... Shik, uh, sorry again uh, to interrupt. Um, you have just about uh, three minutes or so. Can you wind up? Right. No problem. I'll, I'll just take two minutes. You have covered a lot of ground. So I think uh, we the paper has already made a lot of sense to us. So uh, just two I'm minutes sure to wind, wind up. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. <clears throat> The eye of the novel is a self-reflexive and divided subject that shuns the organic view of taking phenomena and completeness, rather explores fragmented and multiple views on human existence, often surrenders to stylistic innovations of unfinished sentences, question marks, and self-articulation. The alienation of the protagonist is not only outcome of colonial tensions and regressive indigenous traditions, but the inability of finding self-referential identity. The novel recreates the life of Shekhar in flashbacks and a series of connected, unconnected images and scenes as they pass through the conscious of the character. The author claims that there has been no design imposed from outside except the occasional reflections and third-person narratorial perspective that stands away from Shekhar. Shekhar from the beginning shows signs of being alienated character who aspires for creative expression. In the childhood, instead of developing emotional affection towards mother, he relates with his elder sister. Saraswati, and consider his mother's uh, consider his mother cruel because of lack of emotion. However, the feeling of affection is abruptly ceased when the sister gets married. Does not even intend to write letters or respond to her letters. Shekhar longs to form long sustained relations with others around him and fails. And from then on, one character of affection gets replaced by other in the long quest of self-realization. From early on, uh, on the for, from early on the reli unreliable settling. Other informs the formation of Shekhar's subjectivity, which in lack of a center remains elusive throughout. Sasi provides Shekhar inner inspiring force around which he weaves his subjectivity and begins to approach life with renewed vigor. However, in the process of becoming Shekhar, Sashi was rendered a selfless and self sacrificial role. Sashi was pushed to the fringes by the conservative society for transgressing the limits set for a married woman. Sashi succumbed to her injuries and insults. Quote from the novel, you are not alive. In the process of my becoming Shekhar, you are broken down, maybe broken down by Shekhar himself. The novel is given a closure with Sasi's death, but the story of Shekhar's growth into a revolutionary and an artist goes beyond the narrative of the first two parts of the novel. Agya, in an interview, repeated the 
that the, the need for the third and the final part ceased and the Shaker's life has moved into a quite a different trajectory than professed in the novel. The novel remains incomplete owing to the irreconcilable contradictions in the character of Shaker, namely his revolutionary ideals and artistic aspirations, individual and society, men's desire and his circumstances. Shaker has followed and abundant various pursuits in the quest of uh, bringing some semblance of meaning to his life. The loneliness and willingness follows him everywhere. Follow him everywhere. The novel then expresses its modern sensibility by revealing the alienation and defragmentation rooted in the very human existence, without any attempt at covering its hideousness or constructing it in relation to purely historical developments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Abhishek. I was about to say thank you, Shekhar. Uh, after listening to you, <laughs> thank you, Abhishek, and uh, you know, Drupadi, uh, Tara, and Abhishek, all all of you, uh, congratulations to all of you, uh, brilliant paper, brilliant papers. Uh, I was listening to you very carefully. There are already quite a few questions which have been uh, shot into the chat box, and the reporters will uh, take over very soon. But before that, I again wanted to congratulate you and. Uh, the, 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 the conference organizers for having made this so very coherent. Uh, I've been listening to the, the proceedings since yesterday and uh, I can't recall even one paper which is off on a tangent, for, you know, the theme, the, the overall concept note that uh, was uh, uh, circulated. Uh, I think all the papers have uh, uh, stuck to the framework of uh, the ideology. Um, uh, and the vernacular and, uh, you know, in the colonial, post-colonial context. So you have done that. Uh, congratulations once again. I was, uh, uh, you know, each of the papers uh, struck a chord in us, um, me particularly, uh, because I've been associated with uh, some of these ideas that you addressed, that of modernity in the case of Avisek's paper and uh, in the other papers about the subjectivity of human rights, particularly uh, the, the uh, uh, two papers, uh, the first two papers, which um, uh, deal with uh, you know, textual aspects of uh, poetry. Thank you very much and over to the reporters. Um, the first question is for um, Ms. Drupadi. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, this is a question from Nisha Zaidi, the head of the Department of, uh, Department of English. Uh, how do life writings by women in which women open up their cells is linked to vernacularity? Um, so, and uh, the second part of the question is, is there a certain uniqueness in their choice of language which you are trying to hint at? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zaid, for this uh, question. I think the three questions that I received on the chat box are somewhere somewhat related. So if I am a little elaborate on this answer, maybe it will attend to some of the queries. So uh, something that I couldn't work out in this presentation, but I hope to do in the paper, is that uh, this bilinguality that we are talking about in terms of gender is not a constant. It's uh, something in flux. And um, therefore, their uh, life, uh, the, the two uh, authors that I've chosen uh, becomes very interesting because they, they were born in the colonial period. Um, I mean, they were born in the 1920s. They saw through that. They saw through independence and uh, their writing in the present time. So they can uh, sort of cover a, a really, really, really interesting uh, sort of temporal um, ground in terms of how we look at bilinguality and gender in particular. And there have been shifting trends. Um, so if you look at, uh, again, it, it might be uh, some sort of generalization, uh, but uh, at the risk of generalization, I would still like to put it that a lot of women um, in the colonial period were in fact uh, writing in, in the vernacular. And uh, sometimes it was a choice, uh, sometimes it wasn't. 
Um, and one, uh, and, and when people were writing about them, interestingly, something has, that has remained constant even now um, is that when academics or, or when there were discourses about their life writing, interestingly, a lot of it uh, was in, in English. Um, uh, uh, and, and an interesting case in point, something that I attended to in my uh, PhD uh, was uh, how um, Christian converts, uh, women who had converted to Christianity, chose, although they were writing in the vernacular, chose to write uh, about their lives in English. A lot of them did. Um, and uh, uh, Zenana missionaries, when they were writing about these women, also chose to write in, in English. Um, which again uh, changes, uh, and, and this is one departure when other uh, women were writing in the vernacular, which, which was very, very popular. So there were, I, I mean, there is uh, obviously a, a, a very conscious choice uh, that one is, is making. Although the kind of schizophrenia um, that, that Meenakshi Mukherjee talks about when she talks about how, uh, you know, the interior and the outer uh, world, as it were, uh, is something that uh, both Devsen and um, Gokhale sort of dispute because uh, they are uh, looking at, as um, I, I gave some examples, they're looking at a very distinct uh, uh, feminist um, genealogy of, uh, of these choices uh, that they make, that they draw through their mothers and grandmothers, right? So it's it's personal and, and political at this at the same time. I think this is something Professor Ghosh had, had asked. So it's, it's very, very similar. So they are making a very, very conscious choice in terms of how they draw this, uh, this genealogy, which is distinct. And then they go through a phase, uh, something uh, uh, which, which uh, today in the morning was discussed by uh, Dr. Nalekar. Both of them are actually very, very active participants uh, in this bilingual uh, poetic culture that uh, interestingly emerges in, in the Marathi literary sphere and the Bengali literary sphere at the same time. So uh, she had taken the example of Arun Kalatkar, but you see Dilip Chitre, you see a host of Bombay poets, uh, Kiran Nagarkar, um, and, and Gokhale was a very close friend of all of these uh, people. In, in fact, she began writing her, uh, you know, she says that uh, she debated as to which language she should write in when she was writing Rita Wellinger, which is her first novel. Then she started writing in Marathi. She had long conversations with Kiran Nagarkar about it. Um, uh, so so that, that, that is one part of it, uh, Navanita Devshen was also part of this, uh, 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 you know, uh, culture that was uh, prevalent in Bengal. You have Vishnu De, uh, you have Buddha De Bosch, uh, the two, two very, very important bilingual poets that she was close to. So they also make, they're very, and, and they're academics at the same time. So there is a lot of self-reflexivity in terms of the language choices uh, that they make. And these are not always very easy choices. Um, Devshen, for instance, writes uh, in Bangla, and um, uh, Gokhale writes about her life writings in English, but a lot of other um, uh, literary uh, sort of writing, sometimes short stories and sometimes novels uh, uh, in, in, in Marathi. And But uh, a lot of her humor uh, that she draws in English at, is actually derived from Marathi and derived from very, uh, very, very, uh, uh, you know, um, very, very regular everyday practices uh, as it were. Um, so it's it's a very complex choice uh, uh, that they make, and it is definitely informed uh, by, by this sort of genealogy uh, that they draw, and it is drawn through a very, very long period of time. So it is in flux, it, it, it keeps uh, changing, and it keeps changing according to the, the, to the sort of changes in these bilingualities as we move from a, a um, sort of colonial to a post-colonial. Era. Thank you. Thank you, Drupadi. Uh, I think you have answered this question, but if you, um, sorry for that, but uh, I'm going to read this question if you'd like to add something. This is from um, uh, one of the admins. Uh, for Dr. Drupadi, do you see the choice of vernacular for life writing by women as specif uh, specifically gendered choice? What possibilities do you think will emerge if we compare life writings in vernacular by women to that of men? Uh, another question I'm going to read both and if you'd like to add something to it. Uh, this is again for you from Dr. Nuradha Ghosh. How can the choice of literary expression in the vernacular be treated as different when one is engaging with women's writing vis-a-vis -vis that of men? 
no matter what the gender, choice of language for literary expression is both personal and political. If you'd like you to comment on that. Um, yeah, absolutely, Professor Ghosh, there is no uh, contention about that. But I think there is a, a particularity in terms of how I follow these uh, two writers and the way that they develop uh, these choices. And I think uh, the crucial uh, bit that I'm trying to highlight is that they do not necessarily fall into one or the other, right? So they're not necessarily only vernacular writers or only um, only writing in English that they 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 fall uh, somewhere in between and they choose this this space rather uh, than a singularity of belonging and um, and they keep traveling between uh, these two um, and and a lot of I think that comes from the from the self reflexivity that you find uh, in their writing. Um, and, and a very, very conscious choice in terms of uh, the sort of genealogies um, that they draw. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that would do. Uh, the next set of questions is for Dr. Tana Tivedi. I'm going to read all the questions and perhaps you can address them together. So, um, sorry, I'm just going to keep my video off because there is a problem with the connectivity here. So if it's okay. We yeah, understand. That's absolutely okay. But can you hear me? Can you hear the questions? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I can hear you. So the first question to you is uh, for Dr. Santivedi. Uh, it asks, do you see the choice of vernacular as a recurring pattern amongst writers who discuss issues of trauma? This is the first question. Then Nupur Chavla asks, you have discussed about the similarity of language in the diasporic experience. But we've been discussing how in a globalized neoliberal world, language is no longer an adequate index of national identity. Do you right. think this like somewhat complicates the concept of diaspora? And the third um, question from Professor Hans. If you try to frame this in terms of language status and vernacularity, would Fiji Hindi in its constellation be a vernacular, in parenthesis, in the sense of spoken language, closes, that enters literature only through the formal variety of English or by, um, in quotes, inhabiting English. And the third right. question of um, Andrada Ghosh, Dr. Andrada Ghosh. Dr. Tana, what is mostly about the vernacular language used in indo fijian poetry? Right. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, go in the order that, uh, that you've read the questions. Uh, the first one uh, about seeing the choice of vernacular as a recurring pattern amongst the writers who discuss the issues of trauma. I mean, very, um, you know, if you just think about trauma as a very personal, as a very intense experience, there is, you can't but express in any other language but vernacular. Right? I mean, uh, especially when you look at the case, you know, if you, if you just imagine for a moment the, um, uh, you know, the the, the Girmityas working in the sugarcane plantations who are, you know, who have been displaced from their homeland, also been uh, made to show a dream, you know, also been made to dream of a better life, whereas they've actually, uh, you know, come back or, or, or actually gone to a, a life which they had not anticipated, having crossed the Kalapani, you know, given all that there was, uh, I mean, there was intense amount of trauma. So even with the fourth generation of, of uh, you know, of Indian, like, like Sudesh Mishra, his poetry is going to, uh, you know, his, his poetry does uh, express the trauma and, and for that he does use uh, the vernacular because that is, is the most intense way or the most natural way in that sense to express the trauma. For instance, you know, words like my bap or, you know, pitaji. Uh, now, these are the words which you cannot possibly translate. You can't use any other language. You I mean, you have to convey it in... Uh, you know, uh, in the vernacular, which also migrated with the uh, with the uh, uh, Girmityas. So yes, so for those who discuss trauma, I think the vernacular is would be the natural choice because that I think is the closest to uh, uh, anybody's uh, uh, articulation, right? A person's articulation. The second one was um, about uh, the centrality of language in a diasporic experience. But in the globalized world, the language is no longer a, an adequate index of national identity. Of course, it does complicate the concept of diaspora completely because, you know, while language is, is such a central aspect to any diasporic population, what happens to the population when, what happens to the group when they uh, start living in the new land? 
and what happens when they start the process of assimilating to the new land uh, what happens then to the language right and language is is how you convey your experience it is it is how you articulate your identity your place within the nation within the other groups that also exist as in case of fiji um so absolutely so uh, while language is central to the diasporic experience it is no longer adequate uh, index alone because you are also uh, you know the, the language is also undergoing mutations it is also undergoing a sense of movement it is also becoming transnational it is picking up different languages it is also becoming a hybridized sort of a form so uh, you know that definitely does complicate the idea of or the concept of diaspora in a very interesting manner so yes um professor okay, uh, hans i have to request the reporters to wrap up you know there is one more uh, yeah so there is this one question uh, for uh, abhishek by dr radha ghosh abhishek in terms of the narrative style how does it relate to the stylistic elements of the genre of 20th century european novels right right so uh, i can see two questions i'll answer them quickly uh, one is by uh, sango he says uh, he talks about he says contact zone seems to be a very good concept uh, he picks it up from probably my uh, abstract of course i also mention it here uh, so i uh, borrow this concept from susan fredman where she talks about uh, modernity in sense of intensification of intercultural zones contact zones so uh, she talks about how uh, a certain historical process can fasten or impact the process of exchange of ideas it doesn't have to be conquest it doesn't have to be colonization it can be a usual process of trade routes or it can be any other sort of historical development which we usually do not you know you know map in the term of conquest of colonization so that is there in susan fredman now in uh, another mass we what Uh, other narrative styles that are akin to 20th century European novel. So I could think of several here. Uh, two, three. Uh, first of all, I see in these stories and novels, uh, they are not using omniscient narr narration, or there is not this presence of omniscient writer. There are multiple viewpoints, and often the narration is unreliable, much like the 21st cent 20th century novel, European novel. Then there is no uh, chronological development of plot. often there is no plot at all in the in the in the very uh, traditional sense so in this novel you would find there is an image which is constructed in the first chapter and you will see this image uh, being recreated in the third or fourth chapter and then there could be the same image in the last chapter but with a with a different overarching structure so that's there and then the novel is not moving very smoothly from you know point a to b to c uh it has a very circular idea of time as well so these are the some of the narrative styles that i could think of which are akin to 20th century novel thank you abhishek um uh, uh, professor sumanyu you may conclude the session now yes uh, um and um, uh, there is hardly any time and i can see that uh, panelists for the next session have come in including the chairperson so again uh, thank you and congratulations to all the participants thank you thank you thank you professor sumanyu satpati